Thank you so much for being here. My name is Aliyah Venick. I'm the events manager here at the Science Museum of Minnesota, and it's wonderful to see you here uh, for our second race, racism, and health panel. Uh, and as I think some of you know, this is going to kick off a day of programming at the museum called Science Celebration. So these programs are part of a campaign to help museum visitors build their understanding of complex and layered racial and cultural issues. This year, our uh, marketing initiative, Science is All of Us and Programming, uh, explores the disparities found in our communities as well as in museums with an emphasis on health. So I'm honored to welcome our wonderful panel of authorities in Minnesota Healthcare to dig into some of the disparities in care and coverage for Indigenous communities in the state and discuss some solutions to bridging the gap. Today's facilitator is Brandon Alkiri. Did I say that right? Alkire. Alkire. I should have checked. That was like, listen, if any of you ever become an events manager, a pro move is to learn how people pronounce their name before you announce it. So Brendan Alkir, um, the Tribal Policy Systems Coordinator with the Minnesota Department of Health. Brandon, thank you for being here. And thank you so much and welcome everybody. Um, and thank you to the Science Museum for taking on this really big task of addressing disparities within healthcare and race and racism. Um, so before we get started today, um, we do have, I know we're gonna, do, I'm gonna do these a little bit out of order um, just because I would love to start with introductions um, before really jumping into laying some foundational understandings of how racism and race exist within indigenous communities and then how that really impacts the delivery of healthcare. So before I do that, um, I'll start with introductions and a, a really tenant to indigenous identity is learning how and allowing for people to tell their own stories. So I'm just going to pass it down to our panelists to tell us about themselves, where they work, and maybe their tribal affiliation. Uh, hello, good morning. My name is Naomi Anawash. I work at the Native American Community Clinic as a senior grants coordinator, specifically working in Indigenous youth mental health. Um, so I go into different schools, provide psychoeducational groups to um, all of you guys, actually. Um, so it's really nice to do all of those things with everybody. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Marissa Anawash. I am Naomi's mother. Um, okay. I've been a nurse for the past 16 years, and my mission in life has always been to serve my own people. So I've never worked in the mainstream clinics or hospitals. I've always worked on the reservation. And currently, I am serving my people at the Native American Community Clinic uh, here in Minneapolis. And I'm also from Pejutizizi Kapi Makoche, where they, the land where they dig the yellow medicine. And Upper Sioux Community is our government name. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Sweet. Hi, everyone. Buju. Biwanikwe Indigenous Cause Nagachi Wanang and Donjuba Zizek and Dodem. Hello, everyone. I just said my spirit name is Blizzard Woman, uh, but you can call me Madison Anderson. Um, and I am Anishinaabe from the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, which is just underneath Duluth. Um, and I use the pronoun she, her, and hers. Um, today I'm here with my MDH hat on, kind of, but not really. One of the many hats I wear is working at the Minnesota Department of Health, and my title there is Tribal Public Health System Consultant. Um, and I'm also currently separately pursuing a PhD in epidemiology right now, which is um, the study of the distribution of determinants of disease. So a lot of the COVID things, you maybe heard a little bit about public health in the during the pandemic. So um, great time to get a degree in public health. If you're interested, we can chat more, but that's a little bit about me and who I am and why I'm here today. All right. Well, it, as I'm Brandon Alcair, I am from the Standing Rock Sioux tribe in North Dakota. I am Dakota. Um, I am a lawyer by training, uh, specializing in federal Indian law. Today, I, I am also uh, work at MDH as the tribal um, state Policy Coordinator for the Office of American Indian Health. Um, and I'm going to be your moderator today. So we're going to get our panel going. Um, 
There's a lot of big, big topics here, um, and I'm going to try to disseminate them the best I can. Um, sometimes I will throw big words out there, so if it seems confusing and if you have a question on the just say, what does that mean? And I will try to um, explain the best way I can sometimes. So with saying that, um, I'm going to move on. And we did introductions. Sorry. I'm going to get started today. And if you don't mind, I'm going to stand up here because Terry feels weird. Um, I'm going to get started today by really kind of grounding us in the topic that we're talking about today. There's some foundational concepts here that I really drive the conversation. Um, I know it says race and racism and Native Americans. Um, one of the foundational tenets to Native Americans is that we don't look at ourselves as a race. Um, and there's a huge piece of uh, there, there's multiple sources on the reason for that. Uh, we are a political status. Uh, if you're familiar with that, what that means is that we engaged in a nation to nation agreements when the, um, when the nation was becoming the United States, um, we were recognized as the existing nation. So, it, and because of that, there's a lot of political agreements that come into those agreements that allow for us to have a unique position when talking with our government today. So um, race does exist. Don't, don't get me wrong. Native Americans do experience race and racism. Um, however, when you go to a tribal nation, and I hope that many of you do go visit a tribal nation, go partake in our ceremonies, our powwows, um, that is indigenous land. And so um, the agreements we did for our treaties were in exchange for land. And so it, 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 it's, a, it's a messy system for us, but just keep in mind that we, are, uh, we review ourselves more as a political status. This doesn't mean that we're not American. We do still hold American citizenship. It doesn't mean that we're not Minnesotans. We are very much citizens of the state as well. So it's complex, and I'm going to try again to keep it very simple um, for the purposes of the conversation today. Identity is a huge one that comes out of this. As you've heard um, our revered colleagues here state, um, there are preferred names for us. Uh, Native American is not our preferred name. We, when many of our tribes were, um, I don't want to say discovered, um, when they were interacted with, um, had a preferred name. And as, as we were saying, yellow, a place where the yellow medicine is found um, is one of those preferred names. So Anishinaabe um, also has its granular. It goes even further than that, depending on where you're from, that has a preferred name. So it's really, it's really important to understand these big, big, big concepts in that manner. That's the proper lens to look at these through because it does make a difference when you're looking at how this plays a role in delivery of health care. Um, unique tribal, unique obligations to tribal nations. This is where those treaties actually came into effect. Uh, there was a unique obligation in exchange for millions of acres of land that health care would be provided for tribes. Um, it does not mean health care within a tribal territory. For example, it doesn't mean health care delivered on the white earth nation. It's health care. Um, so that is anywhere within the United States. Health care was promised and needs to be delivered. That's the obligation, the federal obligation to tribal people. Um, I put tribal citizenry versus United States citizenry because this is the tension that most tribal nations and tribal people deal with on a daily basis is when when does one apply when does the other apply um and even state citizenry could be up here as well um and and it, it's it's key to understand this because there are many places where both apply all three apply maybe one applies um and again we could go way down deep into these any of these concepts um but i wanted to make you aware that they're these are here, they exist, they're real, and you will see some of them rear their faces in our conversation today. So moving forward, 
We're going to start with the healthcare delivery barriers. Um, and as Indigenous people, there are many. Um, federal statute is like the prominent one. Um, there are many, many, many federal laws that exist that are meant to exist to keep tribal nations in the positions they are in, including tribal people with that. Um, the, the most prominent one that comes to mind is this idea of acknowledgement. Um, federally recognized tribes don't have, the, tribes don't have the ability to be, if you're going to access federal resources, don't have the ability to determine upon their own whether or not they are tribes in the eyes of the federal government. We have to seek an acknowledgement process um, and federally recognized tribes are the only ones that can access any kind of funding for healthcare systems. So it's, it, it, that itself is a, a deep, deep, deep conversation, but understand that that is one of the big barriers. We don't get to call ourselves native people. According to the federal government, we have to wait till they acknowledge us. And so that has led to many, many disparities within various agencies, um, education, healthcare, uh, the list goes on and on. Then you get it a little bit more granular and come to state statutes. Many of you might or might not be aware that Minnesota is actually a Dakota word. Um, I would rely on my my colleagues here to maybe explain uh, what Minnesota actually means in Dakota. Uh, it, Arthur? Um, so a lot of different bands of Dakota people will have varying translations, but they're all going to mean around the similar things. One of the things that my kunshi, my grandmother, taught me was that it meant um, land where the waters reflect the clouds or the skies. Um, I don't know if you wanted to expand further on that, Mom, but that's what I was always taught that was mini shota, is land where the water reflects the skies. Right. And then, so my people have come, we, I growing up on Seneca, Dakota, but my, my ancestors are from this area. Um, and for the Native American War, uh, we were displaced to Stanley Rock. They, and it, the displacement went all portions of the country. Um, we, I was always taught as well, uh, mini shuta, um, or, or my, my grandma once said mini ota um, was another interpretation. But it does, you're right, mean um, roughly the same idea. But state statute for Minnesota, we pre-exist the state. Um, but that doesn't mean that we are afforded all the rights and responsibilities with that. So it, today there's a lot, a lot of initiatives going forth that are trying to reclaim some of those pieces that were lost because of the war. Um, but again, could go deeper. Um, federal and state policies exist that really dictate how delivery of healthcare systems can go um, for Native American people. Um, I don't know, does, does any of the panelists have an thought on, um, well, let's, let's get to social determinants because this is everyone's area of expertise here. So I, how many of you are familiar with what social determinants of health are? A few, yes. All right. All right. So social determinants of health are a really key way of understanding how healthcare affects people um, in the peripheral. Um, I hope I'm saying this right <laughs> and correct me if I'm wrong here. But at, those social determinants really determine how uh, when we're doing disease surveillance, answering that question of why this is occurring. Um, and there's many reasons for this to occur. So. I'm going to pass it over to any of the panelists to talk about some of those social determinants as a barrier. Yeah, I can come on in here. So, boujou, everyone. My name is Madison. Um, uh, so, I have a master's of public health. I want to say that. And uh, that's a cool degree. We can talk about that more if you're interested in that. But with that, we learn a little bit more about those social determinants of health. And kind of touching back to what Brandon was saying about the, the social part of it is really setting the context of colonization, right? We understand that there were things in place way before our current existence that have led to what we're in right now. The system that was designed for us was designed um, to essentially try to eradicate American Indians. And so with that, we see these struggles coming forward in the way that we live our current lives and our social in our social ways, in ways that we are defined by, for example, 
like um, thinking about home ownership and how easy that is as a American Indian. Where can you buy a home? How can you get access to those types of funds? It's not necessarily easy um, having access to a car. Um, so there, there are so many different types of social determinants of health that can set the context of why we run into these health disparities that we see in our communities. And really um, what, for example, the Minnesota Department of Health is interested in doing is partnering with our tribal nations and helping them determine what their social determinants of health are and how they want to address that as a community. And so really that's playing into that sovereignty aspect of um, allowing a community to be self-determining and autonomous. Um, I hope that explains a little bit. Yeah, I think that was great. Um, I think one of the main points, you know, and, and I'm getting a little older these days, <laughs> so I feel like I have a little more experience and knowledge, you know, to talk about to other people. Um, and one of the major things is our people do not want to assimilate. So when we um, look at buying cars or buying houses or things like that, it's not a priority to us. So um, we would rather have our own culture back. We would rather have our own way of life back. But we also know that's not possible. Some of it is, some of it isn't. So we have to walk in both of these worlds. So when we live on a reservation, which is, you know, you know, our what we actually is our prisoner of war camps, you know, back from the Minnesota Dakota uh, war. That, those were the places they put us. So we have to exist in what we call what are, is our homelands, but is also our prisoner of war camp. So we also have to exist with the state and the federal government and they've always tried to assimilate us. They always wanted us to be like everyone else, be like the mainstream, but we don't want that. And so when we look at today's culture, that's what everyone's resisting, where um, other cultures, you know, Hasapas, and they, that was their survival in mode was to assimilate. They wanted to be like the mainstream because that was how they were surviving. For us, survival was going back to what we were. So that's always what our wish is. And I think that's a major um, thing that maybe a lot of people don't look at for us is that we don't want to assimilate. So work with us where we're at and try to um, see us as those, you know, wanting to be who we are and not like everybody else. <laughs> um. Just to bounce off of that, everything was created for Native, pe Native peoples as a way to colonize us or to essentially to create a genocide of us. Um, and we just, I don't really have much to add other than I affirming what these two women have already said. Um, everything was created to, to kill us off and to how do we, and now we're living in this world of navigating, how do we live in a society that is still constantly trying to get rid of us? Um, how do we live in a healthcare world where we're not believed when we have pains? It's minimized saying that it's either drug seeking or you don't have access to water. So here's just some fluids and we'll send you back on your way. Um, so we have to live with these stereotypes that are already put on us even if we need that healthcare access so a lot of us end up dying so it's still actively happening to native people and other people of color too um so it's just living in that world in that constant state of trying to survive but also trying to decolonize ourselves and decolonize the western healthcare world too and that's that's a great form of advocacy too that we were discussing earlier before everybody came in is that that it, it's it's the way um, I, and I think there's two really key points here that uh, these ladies are very articulately drew out is that um, one that it's actually still occurring um, we see this with how delivery systems are designed and built um, especially within the state. Um, public health delivery system. <laughs> um, and, and it really was brought forth um, when the COVID pandemic hit 
uh, we didn't realize how I, native people realized how these broken, these systems were, um, the rest of the state didn't realize how broken the systems were when it came to native American healthcare delivery. And so it, what it, what the result was is that you saw just this, it, it, the disparity for native American people with COVID, um, was off the charts and that's per capita. So you saw Native American people were getting hit with COVID and then not being able to seek the same type of health or help um, in the hospital system because it just didn't exist. And so it, it, it's a really, it's jarring. Um, but it, it, again, the form of activism that these ladies bring is that they are in that healthcare system talking, bringing about change and bringing about awareness. I want to preface a little bit. There's, there's also within our policy systems, there are, um, federal, federal policies, and there are seven policies that the federal government has gone through, including, um, assimilation was one, annihilation was another, um, there was a boarding school policy period, a removal policy period, um, and, and the list goes on and on, and there, none of them are better than the other. Right now, we're in a self-determination policy period with the federal government, meaning the official policy for the federal government is to allow us, and I'm saying this very loosely, um, we have more autonomy in making our own way. Um, but understand that, and I'm looking through the room here, there are many, many people of color sitting in here. Understand this is not the struggle of just this one group, right? This is the story of all of us that have been disenfranchised in some form or fashion, um, this could be your story, um, understanding, and you may feel like, why are there no, you know, doctors that look like me? Why are there no teachers that look like me? Why are there no politicians that look like me? This is, this is part of that story of this. Um, and so you are the young people of this uh, this visiting class today, but understand that there, there are reasons that you feel like that. And this is kind of what we're trying to bring forth as far as in the healthcare system today. So, um, the last piece on there is data practices, and this is really a crucial one for us, um, as far as our conversation today, because tribal nations are so, well, let me back up. Tribal population is really tiny. Um, when you do it in a statistical manner, we are, um, deemed insignificant. That's a disgusting way to put it, but it is true. And what that does is that we are not able to access, um, various forms of funding based on that insignificance, or we're not brought into the conversation. But if you did it, there's multiple ways to do it. And we're, we're exploring those right now. Um, of how statistics and data can be gathered and disseminated and put forth in public in use for various fundings. Um, I, I would venture to put even further, like, let's look at a way of looking at if you took all the land under the jurisdiction, now jurisdiction means that under the control of tribal nations, if you put it all together, we would have one entire state. Um, and it could be the state of Minnesota, for example, that's the, roughly the size of, um, all the tribal nations in our nation put together, but yet we don't get the same funding as a state would. And so it, there, there's a really big disparity there, D different conversation though. But I think that's also part of this conversation too, is like, we have to think about who has access to funding and who has access to the ability to apply for funding. And so if tribes are, you know, there's a very big healthcare short healthcare worker shortage in Indian country right now. And so I, that's why I keep pushing. I'm like, yeah, let's talk. If you want to talk more about public health, like, obviously, I want to get people into these roles. But when it comes down to it, the shortage means that we are not able to apply for grant funds. We're not able to apply for other competitive funds that would allow us these types of programs or other opportunities, et cetera. But all that to say, though, I do want to talk a little bit more about data practices because the statistical significance thing really just irks me so bad. It's just bad science to say that. 
If you don't want to deal with small numbers, choose a different field. I don't know. <laughs> like as an epidemiologist, it's easy to work with numbers. And if you work with a community and you work on collecting meaningful ethical data, then we can get to some of these grants that we don't have data to show that we need the money for. Right. So I hope that plays. I hope that made a little bit of sense. I don't know. Sometimes I'm a little rambly. I think in my former life, I was a, a vice chair, chairwoman of our tribal council. And so when they talk about um, insignificance, that really hits home for me. Mm -hmm. um, I come from a reservation that has a total population of 500 people. Now, that's not because um, we're just small. Traditionally, you know, that was what our experiences was were in Minnesota because of the War of 1862. We were removed from Minnesota and still to this day um, are considered wards of the United States. I, um, my personal history is, is I am the first generation non-mandatory boarding school on my father's side of the family. So we have ra been raised, you know, with this um, generational trauma. Um, generational poverty mindsets, you know, so in, in, in reality, I didn't grow up poor. Um, but my mindset is, is that of a poor person. Um, so if any, any of you care to study generational poverty, you might, you might see yourselves and the things you do, um, pop up. And one of those things for me is something crazy. Uh, uh, <laughs> I like to hoard toilet paper. <laughs> and that um, is just born out of the fact that I was raised with uh, grandparents and parents that, you know, were poor and did not want to run out of toilet paper. <laughs> so, um, but yes, those, those, why we're insignificant in numbers is because of the trauma that was done to us. Um, removal. Um, uh, the Indian Relocation Act, um, boarding schools, that's why we're so small. And, and just the fact that we died um, trying to fight the United States, trying to keep them from our homelands, you know. So we became smaller and smaller and smaller. So here we are at 500 people total today. So, but we still need all the things that everyone else needs. We need clean water. We need homes. We need health care. Um, just to add to the, I wanted to say this, is that there's this ingrained, deep, deep ingrained distrust of people that want to come and collect data on Native Americans. And it happens throughout other um, people of color, too. There's a deep distrust with people that are coming to collect stats and other data on us. Um, they want to study us or anything like that. And that is due to Native people and other people of color being used as experimental peoples um, to test va like experimental vaccines on, test medications on. Um, how to even administrate them. It's it's all been tested on people of color and Native Americans, especially like little kids even being pulled out of classrooms to test vaccines on. Um, so there's a deep, deep distrust. So we we really, really need people like Madison to do stuff in public health so that we see this person that can come in and speak Ojibwe and to say, I, I am here to collect data and and help my own people. And so we need people out there to do these things so that we can, so we're no longer deemed an insignificant people that is not worthy of collecting data on because allegedly there's not enough of us. Um, so it, it's this idea of like, we try to protect our own. And so now we need to uplift people to go into areas of public health so that they can come in and help us too and help their own people and help other people of color. And I think that touches on a really great point, too, is I, I, and I want to back up a little bit because I, I, I want to acknowledge that uh, a few of the points that were stated here already is that this value system, um, American value system is not the gold standard. Um, owning a house, owning a car, achieving high levels in education, um, even like wealth prosperity is not 
something you will see Native American. That's not the driving force behind many of our people. Like we, we don't go into professions for wealth gain or uh, the biggest house on the block. We don't, we don't do these comparisons in many fashions um, within our own people. And in, in fact, it's really frowned upon to put yourself above someone else um, and to the point where they will call you out publicly for doing such atrocious things because that is not who we are. We're a very communal group of people. Communal meaning that everything that we gather, including knowledge, is shared. Um, and it's not shared for the benefit of me. It's shared for the benefit of all. And so we don't, there's a word that we don't use generally. Um, it's I. Um, we use we. And, and it's purposeful because within our own community, it, one thing that affects one household is going to have a ripple effect across all. And so when we see somebody starving or going through a hard time, we bring some dinner to them. You know, we bring, we see them not being able to get to the store. We, we drive them to the store. Um, right. Right. Yep. Yeah. It, and that's a really great point. Our population of homelessness that exists on tribal nations is zero because we don't allow that. Um, there's always some place you can go. That is your relative, even if not by blood, but by tioshpe. Uh, they are part of your group. And so we don't allow people to be homeless because that is your cousin, that is your brother, that's your uncle. Um, so... It, there's a, that value system carries forth and, and it, it's really, it comes forth when we look in the world today, when people look at us through the weird stand, American standard of I'm rich, I'm this, I'm this. It's like, who, no, no, we're not. Um, because if, if my, my fellow person over here is struggling, my fellow native brother is struggling, then I'm not rich because he's not where I would like him to be as well. He should have food for his kids. And so I, I think that plays a significant role. And I really want to touch on that here with you guys, because I, I, I mean, you brought it up. It's wonderful to have that lens when looking at it, um, that that is not a driving force to our conversation with healthcare. So um, anything to add? I think the only thing I want to say is like, um, you know, gosh, what is the thought? Yeah, it's gone. Never mind. <laughs> Flew right through my brain. <laughs> well, I'm going to move on from barriers um, to talk about some of the practices that are happening right now um, as far as addressing those barriers. So because I think there's some, there's a, there's some amazing, I think, I know there's some amazing work happening right now. Um, again, you have some of the experts sitting right here that are doing that work. Um, but representation matters. And I don't know if you guys um, are aware, and I, and I hope you are, but we live in a really uniquely positioned state. Um, we have the first Native American lieutenant governor in our nation. We have the first... Native American Supreme Court justice on, on our courts. We have the first Native American Court of Appeals judge. Um, and this is all in my field, so I'm always excited about that. But we also have uh, the largest body of legislators that are BIPOC, um, especially within Native American. I, and so there's, there's a renaissance for our people today. I also wanted to say we have the first Native American endocrinologist. See, there's... Yeah, and we had one of the first in Minnesota Native American doctors in, from Minnesota. Not yep. the first, but she was from Minnesota. So we, we do have a, a lot of... There's a lot of refer, or, uh, representation um, that we have not seen in our history. Um, and it does matter. Um, one of the biggest bits of advice I was given as growing up is if you can imagine yourself in that position, you can get there. Um, up until that point, I, I, I was an, I'm a Navy veteran, um, and I couldn't imagine myself being a lawyer because I didn't know any Native American lawyers until, um, and, and I, I did it later on in life, but I was mentored by our Supreme Court Justice. And so 
I, I could see myself in that role. Um, and that's the groundbreaking piece that we have today is our young people can, you're, you're the young people. If you see yourself in that role, um, you can do it. And so I want to bring that forth as far as representation goes. Um, I did, I, I cringe when I put, look at this picture right now, cause yeah. <laughs> it's not the contemporary person. Um, it's not the contemporary Native American. Obviously, this is the contemporary Native American group sitting here. Um, we are everywhere. We're, we're police officers. We're judges. We're um, doctors. Uh, we're we, researchers, too. Researchers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we don't sit around in feathers and leathers. You know, that's, that's kind of what that is. It is a very proud part of our heritage. We still have very much regalia for our ceremony times during the summer, and we are very proud of when we get to put those on. Um, however, we don't go to work like this. And so it, I, it, it's purposeful that it's there so we can talk about that. But it, it, representation does matter. Um, Madison, do you want to talk to us about the, um, some of the health equity initiatives that are going on? right now. Yeah, for sure. So over in the Minnesota Department of Health, we have two kind of like tracks of work that we do. We work with local public health, which is how the governmental public health delivery is at the county city level. And then we also work with tribal public health partners. So those are going to be our tribal health nations. And within that, we are really interested in working with tribal partners and helping them move their health equity forward. And so importantly, we want to talk about sovereignty and self-determination. And we want these tribal nations to determine how they want to look. What does health look to them? Right. And so we've been working on this tribal public health infrastructure grant that will be pulling together all the tribal nations in Minnesota to help move our public health forward in the way that we partner with tribal nations. Um, but overall, when we talk about health equity initiatives, it's important to say that we, we, we do set aside pots of money for our tribal nations. And people don't necessarily agree with doing that. And they think it's kind of odd we do that for our tribal nations. But for all of the reasons that we've already said, colonization has set us up to be where we're at. And because of that, we understand that the tribal nations need this money. We have set it aside for them to be able to push their health equity forward in regards to how we do our public health delivery system. And so making sure that they are the priority, their point of opinion is the most important, and that they set the agenda when we move forward these initiatives is so important. Um, a lot of us in the field of public health are starting to realize that you know, these practices that we do in regards to public health and caring for people on a population level is really just indigenous care systems. It's kinship systems. It's really making sure that we have our communities set up to be in the best way possible. Um, our, our communities are relearning that we're researchers. We're relearning that we have been studying these things for so long, right? Science is not unnatural to indigenous peoples. And so um, all that to say, we need good data out there. And so part of that is making sure we have that data to show where we're progressing and things. And so I'm really excited to see what our tribal nations um, choose to be their determinants of health and how they want to move forward their health equity. It's going to be so cool to see. This is such new work that we're doing at the state level. Um, other states have been interested in in moving forward health equity initiatives with their tribes, but we're, we're just so excited that some of the tribes in Minnesota even want to partner with us. They don't have an obligation to work with the state. So it's very exciting. Um, I hope that makes some sense, Brandon. It I does. tend to ramble. Well, and it, it, I would also like to bring it to like how this, what does this look like when it's applied, right? Because I, I think that's really important. And, and one great example is uh, your picture where it says we're on native land. That is from Sean Sherman's restaurant, Owamini. I don't know if any of you have been there yet. But that is how health, um, health equity can look when you understand what even like the, how the delivery of food occurs. Um, indigenous food meant for indigenous people and everyone, actually. It's not just for one group of people. It's for everyone. When you start eating really well, it really does, your body starts to feel differently. 
And so it, I, there's many, many, many examples of how that looks as far as activism goes and how it connects to uh, healthcare and the social determinants. And so um, thank you, Madison, for that. Um, educational recruitment is one of our key ones um, in part of my personal ideology is I believe that, you know, any trajectory that pulls you out of poverty has to begin with education. We have to know. Um, and there's a history there that we're praying never gets forgotten and we, we will not let it get forgotten as indigenous people, but as anyone, as an American people too, there's a really gross history that this country has towards BIPOC people and the treatment of BIPOC people. So, um, Maybe do you want to talk about some of those efforts um, and how you see education within our community? Sure. Um, first of all, you know, I think I was introduced so you guys all know that I'm a registered nurse and I've been that for about 16 years. And um, also, you know, with that tribal government background, it's super important. And one of my personal goals is to recruit young people like you to take my place <laughs> get and make me um get out of this job and, and move along um as it stands today when i go to work every day i realize that there's nobody to take my place there's nobody following in my footsteps to become a nurse um and that is huge not only in the mainstream um healthcare professions uh the the downward trend, the sinking rates of people going into healthcare is not just indigenous, it's in everywhere. So when we look at our small population of indigenous healthcare professionals, it's even tinier and tinier. So I urge everyone in here that you think about it, take a look at it. If you want to um join the movement of uh Decolonizing healthcare is what I would like to call it. Um, I call it the resistance. <laughs> um, join my resistance to um, Western healthcare systems um, and and move us forward into a place where uh, we can all be healthy, and not just some of us, but all of us. So I urge all of you guys to take up a, a healthcare profession somewhere in the, you know, spectrum. Um, but of course, I'm always going to urge for nursing um, because we really need them. There's, a, in in this whole big city, I can count probably on two hands the indigenous nurses that are available. And we're all, we're all getting old. <laughs> so we need you guys. Um, there's so many grants out there, scholarships, um, that can pay for your entire education. They'll pay for your house payment. They'll pay for your rent. They'll pay for your car. They'll pay for your phone. They'll pay for everything. That's how bad it is. That's how much they want you to go into healthcare. Um, so you need to look for those, need to find that person in your life that will help you seek those grants out. Um, a lot of them used to be that you had to be enrolled. You had to be a quarter. But um, with the new push to self-determination and we determine who we are as a nation, uh, we determine who you are as a member of tribes, uh, that's no longer true. That's going away. Um, so don't let that be your barrier. Um, a lot of us are mixed tribes. So the go U.S. government was always like, you. C once you were left that quarter blood quantum from that one particular tribe, you were no longer Native. But we have people that are almost full-blood Native American, but they're not enrolled because of those um, multiple tribes in their, you know, the backgrounds, and which is how it should be. Nobody should be only one tribe because um, that's actually a taboo. You don't want to be all in one right. tribe. <laughs> so that would be bad. <laughs> um, you want to be different tribes, and that's how we traditionally were. So myself, I am half uh, Ojibwe from the White Earth a Reservation in northern Minnesota, and I am half Sisseton Wapton Dakota on my mother's side. So, um, and then this is my daughter, who is also 
mixed tribes, <laughs> which is how it should be. <laughs> okay, I could go on and on. So, okay, go well, on. And, and maybe you could. <laughs> well, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on the some of the pieces that we're talking about here in your experience working with youth. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the comparison between traditional medicine and Western medicine? Um, yeah, so we talked about it quite a bit already up here. Um, so my focus is actually on mental health, youth, indigenous youth, mental health. Um, and something that we're finding, and I know that we said that we are a communal peoples, um, something that we're finding is that with a lot of youth and specifically with a lot of people of color and a lot of um, indigenous youth is that that traditional one-on-one -on -one therapy, um, traditional one-on-one -on -one, um, mental health sessions are not resonating. They're not having an impact on our indigenous youth. And what we are finding is working with them is group sessions that aren't directly ther like therapy. Um, it's experiment, um, experimental therapy, kind of, um, and it's with their peers. Um, and we're also working on finding things that will bounce off of that further. So one of the things that I work on is preventing uh, suicidality, um, suicidality, prevention and intervention. Um, and we're finding that youth will go to youth before they go to adults. Um, so we're working on trying to work out that communal mindset and figure out how we can help our youth and uplift them so that they can have the tools, as my mother has told me many times, make sure you have all the tools in your toolbox. <laughs> so we have to make sure that these youth have all the tools in their toolbox so that they can help provide for themselves and their own community without getting burnt out, without having their resiliency completely broken, um, how they can help their own peers and when they can reach out, who they should reach out to and making sure that they have access to their community to help them. Because if we give them all of their tools, as we used to do traditionally, making sure that everybody had access to everybody, no matter what age you were, no matter what your place was in society or anything like that, your income level, anything, we made sure that everybody was taken care of. I know we said earlier that on our tribal lands, our homeless population is zero. We have zero homeless people. So, and that is because we are communal based peoples. So making sure that mental health is communally based for our youth um, and that it doesn't have to be one-on-one -on -one therapy. And if that does something that is working for them, making sure that they also have access to that and readily have access to it. If they want access to it versus for texting, if they want it on online, if they want it face-to-face, -face, we can do that. Sometimes they want that one-on-one -on -one therapy, but they don't want it to be with a social worker or with a therapist. They want it to be with a traditional elder, somebody that's going to be able to teach them about their language, about traditional medicines, smudging, sweetgrass, cedar, um, other traditional medicines, bear root, how to use those, where to access them, how to harvest them. Because we have found that when we heal and we learn our culture, that's part of our healing process of that generational trauma. Um, taking that back and that's part of that decolonization and we when we do that for our youth they're uplifting themselves and uplifting and they will raise a a, a more even more healed generation um, that will have access to their language and have access to their culture and have access to mental health and they feel more readily empowered to access all of that instead of it being a taboo which is what something that westernized society has done that maybe even our male youth shouldn't access mental health because it's demasculating. It's not demasculating. That is something that our, our men have done for the beginning of time um, and making sure that they know that that mental health is traditional. Mm -hmm. Mental health is something that we've always had and it's something that we've always focused on. It's something that our medicine men have always done. It's something that our medicine women have always done and that it is something that we can access and it is something that we should access. And, you know, there's, we, we touched a lot about value systems within our community. And one of the biggest, um, for, at least for our people is, uh, this idea of matriarchy. Uh, we, we lived in a matriarchal society. Um, when the United States start trying to do treaties with tribal nations, they didn't understand how a woman could be in control. Um, I was very fortunate to grow up around a ton of powerful women. 
Um, my mom was one of the first administrators of our tribe. So I only ever seen women in power. Um, it wasn't till we moved to the city that I didn't, it was, it was a culture shock to arrive here because one, I didn't realize we were poor until I got here and I was like, oh, we are poor. Um, but to, to see women in roles that they traditionally held within our own people in our own tribes, um, not being or being denied while in Western society, uh, was a really big shock to me. So, um, when federal governments came to tribes to negotiate treaties, they couldn't see women in these roles. And so what they did was take the first men they saw and say, you are now the chief and we're going to negotiate all this land for you. And many times they weren't even purveyors of that area. They were, sometimes they were from different groups of, or different groups of people in different parts of the country. Sometimes they brought their own. Um, so it, there's a lot of pervasive actions that occurred during that time. Again, that's a whole different topic right there, but, um, it, it really discusses and talks about our value system within our own people that we can see women in roles of power. We can see men crying. Um, and that doesn't mean that that affects their masculinity. That doesn't do anything to them, um, because it's part of who we are. And so I think that touches a lot of those points right there of, um, how to integrate both cultures and the two worlds that native people walk or other BIPOC people walk when they are traveling through, um, a predominantly Eurocentric society. So. I'm looking at the time right now. It looks like we have like five minutes. I am going to go through and do one of the closing words. Okay, so it's really cool because we all know each other in really great capacities, obviously, because of professionalism or whatever. Um, but um, I just want to say that I got started in liking science and technology and engineering and math and STEM by going to the University of Minnesota Morris, which is a really great school that has a tuition waiver for American Indian students. There are some stipulations with that. However, it connected us throughout our educational paths. We've, we've been able to hang out and push forward public health in the way of aunties and residents as a program at Morris, um, which is a program that we came up with in trying to figure out how we could best support students and being able to give them that peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, so. Not only do I want to say Morris is a great place to go, but I just want to say if you have any questions, want to talk about anything about education, if you want to laugh about cat memes, like I'm available, willing to chat, love chatting about things. Um, so that's me, Madison Anderson. I'm a goofball. See you later. <laughs> you are a goofball. Just kidding. <laughs> um, so parting words. Um, if you need any help, I'm always available. You can find me at the Native American Community Clinic. You want to come become a nurse. You want to become anything. You want to become the president of the United States. I will help you get there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but seriously, yes, I, I what I say is really true. If you need help, you want someone to direct you down a path of wherever you want to go, I will try to help you get there. And seriously, that's where you can find me. Native American Community Clinic on Franklin Avenue. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, my mom uh, pushed me to get to where I'm at. I would like to tell people that I wouldn't be where, I would at, where I'm at right now um, if it was not for my mom or Native youth workers. Um, and that's what kind of also pushed me to become a Native youth worker and to also pursue higher education. Um, also want to say it's okay to continuously change your major no matter how old you are, how far along you are in your schooling. My background is a political science degree. I enrolled in law school and I'm not doing anything really near that right now. <laughs> um, I'm looking at other degrees and I'm 28 years old. So it's fine to change things around. It's fine to go back to school. It's fine to delay school. I delayed for a year going to school so that I could travel around and figure out what I wanted to do. Then I decided I didn't want to go to or that I did want to go to school. Didn't know what I wanted to go for. It's okay to go not to go to school and not know what you want to go for. You can figure it out, take some random classes, do whatever you want. Um, but just, yeah, just fig dream big. <laughs> and I would echo that. Like, I, uh, everybody's on their own journey. You're on your own journey. Nobody's there's the, the mile markers that, uh, institutions like to put on various people to say, you should be here at this age. 
Um, one of the funniest things I, I noticed when doing college applications was why is there a gap in your education? And it's like, that's none of your damn business, right? That's <laughs> There should not be um, questions like that because it's my journey. Um, all you're concerned about and you, what you only should be concerned about is did my check clear? And so it, I'm here I, and keep that in mind. Don't hold yourself to an unreasonable standard. That's not going to get you where you want to be. Um, you'll get there when you get there. And it might not be the end point you're pondering right now. Sometimes you find things um, as you go. So. I echo that. I am also available if you ever have questions or um, may need help getting to those points you need to get to. So thank you. Um, and thank you to our panelists. This is really fun. Um, <laughs> and we will stick around for a little bit if you if anybody wants to come down and talk or have us a question. Um thank you. Karaoke starts uh <laughs> right. No, okay. <laughs> have a good day, y'all. Be kind. Yes. Enjoy the science museum.